My name is Ellen Holstey, and I am the Community Program Manager at Pierce Cedar Creek Institute, and I want to welcome everyone to our second virtual herpetology conference. So our last speaker today is Yu Man Lee. She's a conservation scientist with Michigan Natural Features Inventory. She was also one of our highlighted women scientists on our uh, story walk trail this month. Uh, we love Yu Man at the Institute. Uh, she's a great speaker and has lots of great knowledge on vernal pools. And I hope you learn a lot from her today. Well, thanks, Ellen, for the opportunity to present today as part of this wonderful conference. And thank you for all your work organizing the conference and all that you do for her conservation. And thank you to everyone who attended uh, the conference today. And for those of you who are sticking around for my talks, the very last talk of the, the day, um, as, as many of you know, and probably have heard during some of the presentations today, uh, a lot of our, many of our amphibian reptile species in Michigan are in some kind of conservation trouble or have been declining. And so the more that we can do to increase you know, awareness and understanding of these species and their conservation needs, and the more that we can get people engaged um, in, in helping us with uh, trying to conserve these species, uh, um, the, the better, at least in, in my opinion. So today we're going to, um, today I'm going to talk about what vernal pools are and how amphibians use vernal pools, um, particularly for breeding, and why they're really important habitats for our amphibians, especially those that are living in the forest, and why vernal pools are just important, you know, ecosystems in general, um, and some of the threats that are facing vernal pools, um, as well as these amphibian species. And then we'll um, end and talk a little bit with about how, uh, what we can do to try to help conserve vernal pools and these forest amphibians, especially things that you can do um, to help them. So we'll go ahead and get started. So you probably have seen if you've spent any time walking around in the woods in uh, the spring or you know uh, in the winter time maybe even, um, and seen these uh, little puddles or pools of water in the woods. And maybe you thought to yourself, you know, it's just a little mud puddle and um, probably nothing lives in there, maybe except for mosquitoes, it's a little mosquito breeding ground. And you would not be alone. <laughs> so there's, I think, uh, you know, a lot of people that don't really know um, about these vernal pool ecosystems. And, and we didn't even know really how important um, and interesting and diverse and, and how important these ecosystems are for um, healthy forests and, every, and uh, ecosystems until probably maybe a decade or two ago. And so what, what is a vernal pool? Um, so these uh, vernal pools are these seasonally flooded wetlands that are usually wet in the spring, and then they dry up by uh, late summer, early fall. And vernal pools in Michigan and in the glaciated Northeast generally occur in forested landscapes. They can occur in other um, habitat types too, but when we think about these vernal pools and these particular indicator species that we're gonna talk about today, um, we're usually thinking about vernal pools that are in forests. And then because they dry up on an annual or regular basis, fish can't survive in these wetlands. Um, and fish are really voracious predators. So without this uh, predation pressure from fish, you can get these really unique and diverse species that are able to um, inhabit and live in these wetlands and do well in these wetlands that you can't find in other uh, wetland or aquatic eco ecosystems that have fish predators. So they're really, really interesting and diverse um, ecosystems. They've actually been referred to as a coral reef of uh, northeastern forests because um, there's so many, you know, there's such incredible diversity and they provide such important ecological services to um, the forest ecosystems. So here are just some pictures of vernal pools um, that uh, you can see on the pictures on the left of vernal pools that are wet in the spring. And then um, by, you know, in the upper right corner, that vernal pool was actually wet by the end of June. That was kind of a dry summer. And then, um, you know, so usually wet, a dry by, you know, late summer or fall. And vernal pools are usually um, small and shallow. So most of them are smaller than less than, you know, smaller than two and a half acres. And actually most of them are even smaller than that, you know, smaller than less than a um, quarter acre or half an acre. And they're usually pretty shallow, um, less than a meter or three feet deep. You can get some vernal pools that are a little bit bigger, like the photo in the um, lower right there on the slide. Um, and that pool actually, I was amazed when I saw the photo of it, uh, that it actually dried up. So you can get vernal pools that are a little bit bigger that will dry then. 
vernal pools are usually considered, um, and I put isolated in quotations because we're starting to, you know, move away from that concept. Um, but in general, vernal pools um, don't have any kind of uh, permanent or persistent uh, connection to any permanent water, um, at least on the surface, so surface water connection then. But um, vernal pools can be and are often connected hydrologically and biologically to the surrounding forest ecosystem and in, in the watershed. So for example, some vernal pools can uh, be connected due to other vernal pools or wetlands or aquatic um, systems through groundwater. And then they're also biologically connected in terms of the species that occur in them are moving um, in vernal pools can occur in the vernal pool and then also in the surrounding forest um, ecosystem. So we want to think of them as really being part of that forest ecosystem. And so that's sort of why we're kind of uh, moving away from, you know, calling them isolated. And there are different types of vernal pools. So you can have, uh, and you know, I think the classic vernal pools in that upper left corner there, uh, called you know these more really open vernal pools where there's um, not much vegetation growing in them, and they're often um, in these, you know, surrounded by these dry, drier uh, upland forest systems. Um, but then you can also get, you know, vernal pools that are a little more open with a lot of grasses and sedges, what we kind of refer to as marshy pools. Some vernal pools have a lot of, can have a lot of shrubs in them. Um, so in southern Michigan, maybe you've seen some uh, vernal pools or some button bush uh, wetlands, um, or up north would be more um, alder species. And then um, we also have some forested vernal pools that are sort of more like forested swamps um, or uh, vernal pools that occur along floodplains of rivers. So they can be highly variable in the type of vegetation that they have in them or around them. And then because vernal pools dry annually or on a regular basis, and because that of that lack of fish predators in these wetlands, vernal pools um, provide really important breeding habitat for invertebrates and amphibians, including species that only occur in vernal pools or rely on them for their survival. And we call these species um, vernal pool indicator species. So they have specialized life history strategies for surviving and breeding in vernal pools. So in Michigan, we have four vernal pool indicator species, which are the ones that are shown here on the slide. Um, fairy shrimp in the upper left photo are these um, small aquatic invertebrates or um, actually we call them actually fairly large crustaceans. They're in these uh, vernal pools. They're about, an, it, they grow to about an inch long and they're usually this transparent salmon, orange in color, but they can also be light green, blue and red. And fairy shrimp only occur in vernal pools. So in no other ecosystems, um, partly because of their inability to avoid fish predators. They, you know, fish would just eat them all up. Um, but, uh, but their eggs also need to dry out and in some cases freeze and thaw, um, we call cold conditioning before they can actually hatch. And the adults only live for a few weeks to a month um, in the early spring in these vernal pools. So that's another strategy for helping them to avoid predation by being active when there are fewer you know, predators in the pools, because even though there's no fish, there are other, uh, some of these invertebrates and amphibians that live in the vernal pools that um, will prey on fairy shrimp. So they tend to occur really early in the season and the eggs are in the pool substrate and they hatch as soon as the vernal pools fill with water. Um, they're filter feeders and they filter out zooplankton, algae and bacteria from the water column. They grow quickly um, over the course of, you know, uh, several weeks to a month. They mate, the females lay or, you know, um, expel their eggs into the pool, which fall to the bottom of the pool. And that's where they stay um, until they hatch again the following spring. So if you find fairy shrimp in a wetland, you, you know that that is probably most likely a vernal pool um, because they only occur in vernal pools or that that, pool, that, wet, that water body must dry you know, at some point in time on a regular basis. They're really cool. So if you ever get a chance to go out to a vernal pool and see fairy shrimp, they're really awesome. And then there are three amphibians that are shown here, the wood frog, blue spotted salamander and spotted salamander that um, we consider to be indicator species in Michigan. Um, these three species occur primarily in forest ecosystems. Wood frogs um, have a really large geographic range. They're the only frog that occurs as far north as the Arctic Circle because they have a special adaptation, a natural antifreeze that allows um, two thirds or more of their body water to freeze in the winter and thaw in the spring. So it's really cool. And the wood frogs typically live up to three to five years in the wild. 
Spotted salamanders and blue spotted salamanders are known as mole salamanders because they live, they spend a lot of time underground actually. So outside of um, the breeding season when they're in the vernal pools or moving to the vernal pools, or maybe on warm rainy days and nights um, where you might find them on the surface of the forest, most of the time they're gonna be underground in these burrows and you have a really hard time you know, finding them. They um, have lungs and they can live up to 20 years. So these three species can inhabit and breed in other wetlands besides vernal pools, but they prefer or have the highest reproductive success in vernal pools because of that lack of fish predators. So um, as I mentioned, so vernal pools are really important habitats for amphibian breeding and reproduction, especially for those three um, vernal pool indicator species, the wood frog, spotted salamander, and blue spotted salamander. That's where they mate, they lay their eggs, and the larvae develop until they metamorphose or turn into adults or, or their adult form. And uh, you know, hence the name for this talk about vernal pools being nature's nurseries for forest amphibians. These species have um, adaptations that allow them to do well in vernal pools. So first, they're among the first amphibian species to become active in winter, early spring. So they start to become active as soon as um, they move to the pools and they become active as soon as the pools melt or when they have, when they have thawing or they filled with water. Um, they tend to move to the vernal pools on the first warm rainy nights, um, actually about almost a little bit later, but about this time of year, typically in mid to late March or early April, but can be earlier or later, depending on the spring that we're having. And they usually move through the forest floor on these warm rainy nights, usually in the 40s or 50s, um, but sometimes even in the upper 30 degree temperatures then. And these species can be really explosive breeders. They can have these mass migrations where you can get hundreds or thousands or even hundreds of thousands of them moving to the vernal pools for breeding and egg laying. And these mass migrations have been called the great migration or the big night um, in the Northeast, that's what they call it. And in some places, um, amphibians have to cross roads actually to get to their breeding pools, like the photo of the blue spotted salamander crossing a road in that lower left photo. And then that's from a, a picture um, that's from the uh, UP, uh, I think in the Marquette area. And a significant number of them can get hit by cars and killed on roads annually during these big night you know, mass migrations. In some places, you have conservation groups or even just interested community members that organize volunteers. That, you know, they kind of go out and they stand along these roads where these salamanders and frogs are crossing, and they help them cross the road safely. <laughs> and um, they've helped, you know, hundreds of these, these amphibians cross the roads. Um, in some cases, they've actually been able to get, you know, local townships or you know, uh, to close these roads temporarily during the mass migrations. And actually, that happened up um, again up in the UP, I think, in the Marquette area there. Uh, so um, there have been studies, uh, there was a study that looked at during COVID when we had you know, a lot of reduced traffic, people weren't you know, commuting or moving as much around and um, there was significant reduction in amphibian mortality um, when, uh, during COVID then. So you can really, it, it can be a really huge issue in some places where, you, you know, where they're moving and crossing roads. But so they, they move to the pools, you know, they're really explosive breeders, they get to the pools early as they can. And then um, in terms of the spotted and blue spotted, spotted salamanders, once they're at the pool, they um, quickly breed. Um, so they might spend a couple of days in the pool um, or maybe a couple of weeks in the pool. Um, they'll lay, you know, the females will then lay, uh, they can lay up to, you know, hundreds or thousands of eggs um, in these pools. And then um, the eggs hatch in, you know, two to three weeks up to maybe a month or two. And then the larvae um, develop quickly. So, and then they metamorphose or turn into adults in two to three months, usually by July or August, and then they're out of the pools then. So it's really a race against time, you know, to be able to um, develop and get out of the pools before they dry up. So a couple of things, that, interesting things I wanted to point out then. Um, so the male salamanders typically arrive at the breeding pools first, and then they'll deposit these, um, you can see on the lower left there, they'll deposit these um, these little white things, these spermatophores or sperm packets, usually on leaf litter or on branches. And then the females arrive at the pools, um, they'll mate you know, with the males and the females walk across those sperm packets and they pick up the sperm packets as they lay their eggs to fertilize them. They usually lay their eggs attached to woody branches or leaf litter. Um, you can see in the photos there um, with the blue spotted salamander eggs attached to those branches or the blue spotted salamander eggs. Um, and then they uh, usually lay those eggs, these egg masses. So a bunch of eggs all kind of um, enclosed together in a, in a gelatinous little clump. Um, 
And then uh, that's where, and you can see up in that upper right photo here, um, these are eggs of spotted salamanders. And you can see uh, they, this is little, each one of these is a little salamander larva and an egg that's gonna hatch out then into the pool. And then when they hatch out and grow, they eventually look like this photo here on the um, right in the middle of the slide. And then that's when they turn into a metamorphose and turn into their adult form then. And one of the cool things about spotted salamanders in this photo with this green, some, some of them, these egg masses will have this greenish color. And that's actually because they have a um, symbiotic relationship with um, this green algae where the algae, um, where the, um, the algae, you know, live with the, the, in the eggs and actually in the adults as well. They get nutrients from the waste products from the salamander larvae and then the salamander larvae get oxygen from the algae then. So it's um, the only, or maybe one of the only species that has this symbiotic relationship with algae. So pretty cool. And then this is the wood frogs. They have a similar strategy where um, the males arrive at the vernal pools first. The males are calling, trying to attract females to mate with them. Um, they mate, uh, they, you know, actually the males and females there are here. Um, and then the males are on top and the females on the bottom. And then as the uh, female lays the eggs, then they're um, fertilized. And then these are the egg masses here um, in the middle of the slide. Um, you can see these are like a whole bunch of, again, you know, hundreds of eggs then that are attached together in these clumps. And wood frogs actually um, in the upper uh, middle slide there, that's a whole bunch of wood, uh, wood frog egg masses that occur in what these call, what they call, uh, we call rafts, um, where they're all attached together on attached to vegetation. And then they hatch um, into these tadpoles, like the one shown on the um, upper right, on the very right side of the slide, um, where they have these gold little flecks and they, but they usually appear kind of small black tadpoles in the pools. And they, um, as they develop, they turn into this little frog there where it's almost a, an adult frog on the lower right there. And then, um, Eventually they metamorphose into adults again by uh, July or, or August or even earlier. And in Michigan, there are other amphibians that regularly or occasionally breed in vernal pools. There are about 15 other amphibian species. Um, and this table shows on the left side is all the salamanders and which ones um, use vernal pools as their primary breeding habitat. So species like the marble salamander, smallmouth salamander, um, tiger salamander, and the four-toed salamander. And then um, you've uh, on the right, the table on the right shows the frogs and toads that use vernal pools for breeding, including the ones that use them as their primary breeding habitat, um, such as the uh, Western chorus frog. But then you've got other species that like spring peepers and gray tree frogs. Um, and then these other species that might occasionally use uh, vernal pools for breeding. So they can provide breeding habitats for a number of different amphibian species. And it turns out that, you know, not all vernal pools are created equal in terms of amphibian breeding use and um, breeding success. So um, these are, an example I wanted to share was um, these two photos here uh, where we've got um, pool A and pool B. And these were two vernal pools I found in Hillsdale County that were pretty much like sort of right next to each other. Pool A was actually a much larger vernal pool, probably two or three times the size of the vernal pool in the, uh, pool B. But um, actually by, uh, I went back in late May and that was a really dry year. Pool A was almost completely dry. The larger pool and pool B was um, still had quite a bit of water. So um, you have you can have vernal pools that are right next to each other can have very different lengths of time that they hold water, which is what we call their hydro period or the duration of inundation or flooding. And also the rate and the timing of the drying um, can have huge effect on uh, amphibians um, using these pools and also their breeding success. So if they don't hold water long enough for the larvae to actually metamorphose and turn into adults, you can you know, um, have little to no recruitment or um, reproductive success in that given year. So you can lose a whole cohort of these amphibian larvae then. And all species have like a minimum hydro period that they need to develop or time on the time that they need to develop. So wood frogs can metamorphose in as little as two months after egg laying, whereas spotted salamanders can, spotted salamanders can take up to four months to metamorphose. Um, and in some cases you can have really high um, you know, failure. So um, in uh, the Yale forest in Connecticut, they've reported that even in a year with average rainfall, entire cohorts of larval wood frogs can fail due to pool drying in about 35% or a third of their breeding pools then. So this can be a really significant issue um, in any given year. But if you have lots of vernal pools and you have vernal pools that have different, you know, maybe some pools that last longer and you have wet years and drier years, you know, that kind of variability can even itself out over time then. Over time then. Um, 
So having longer hydrogen periods is really a critical factor in these pools. And often um, you get higher uh, survival, spotted salamander higher survival in these longer pools. Um, so, cause they take a little longer to metamorphose but also gives them more time so they can, when they do turn into, you know, their adult form, they can also be a little bit bigger, which then helps them to have higher survival rate as a juvenile then. Um, you can have higher egg mass densities in pools that have longer hydro periods, but there's also a cost to um, breeding in these higher vernal pools with higher hydro, longer hydro periods, because you also might get more potential for predators who need usually, um, you know, wetlands that uh, last hold water longer, like green frogs are a predator in these systems, even when you don't have fish. And so you get more, um, more chance for these predator populations to establish in these longer hydro periods. So there's kind of this like, you know, the happy medium, the, the Goldilocks effect, right? What's the maximum hydro period that, um, that allows you to maximize your larval production, but also control the amphibian, the uh, predator populations. And then there's other factors that can affect breeding site selection and success in amphibians. So things like canopy cover can impact water temperature um, and, high, and how long pools hold water and the amount of food or nutrients in a vernal pool. So that can really affect um, which species are able to use the, a particular vernal pool for breeding. Um, and some vernal pool amph amphibians do well in these closed canopy vernal pools like wood frogs, spotted salamander, and marble salamanders, whereas other species do better in more open canopy vernal pools like spring peepers and green frogs. Um, having uh, you know, cover like leaf litter and woody debris in vernal pools like logs and branches can provide that habitat structure and you know, refugia from predators um, or any changes in environmental conditions for adult amphibians as well as larvae, and also provide sites for, you know, um, for them to attach their egg masses. And so that's an effa a factor, you know, presence of this on um, these cover um, in vernal pools can help contribute to amphibian use or, and maybe densities of the egg masses in these vernal pools. Also presence of fish um, or other predators. So some species like wood frogs can actually detect when fish are present in a wetland and they won't lay eggs in these situations or they'll avoid or they or they will avoid and move to other wetlands that don't have fish. Um, water chemistry and quality obviously is important for you know determining whether amphibians are going to use these vernal pools or have success in breeding in them um, because they are, you know, as amphibians really sensitive to water quality. And then also um, site fidelity. So um, wood frogs and spotted salamanders and blue spies tend to return to the same breeding pools year after year to breed. Um, and wood frogs, you know, they've estimated 80 to 100% of the time they return to the same brooding pools to breed. And in some cases, they go back to even the same pool in which they were born or developed as larvae um, to breed. So it's pretty cool. So I think, you know, sometimes I'm thinking that, oh, well, they just put them in any wetland and they'll be fine. Um, it's not necessarily true. And also um, there are landscape level effects for amphibian use, abundance and survival in these um, vernal pools or area surrounding. So the type of habitat is the surrounding landscape is critical for amphibian use of vernal pools for breeding. Uh, vernal pool amphibians um, only use vernal pools for a very short period of time. And then the rest of the time, the rest of the year, they're primarily in the surrounding landscape then. And so um, the wood frog is a good example of this where uh, you can see here, they attach a little transmitter on a wood frog and they found that the wood frog um, leaves a vernal pool in spring, and then it goes to spend most of the summer in this forest wetland habitat. And then in the winter, it moves to upland forest habitat for overwintering. And then in the spring, it goes back to the vernal pool and spends a couple, you know, a few days to a few weeks up in the vernal pool for breeding and then repeats it again. So in order to have wood frog populations in this area, you need to have all those different habitats to be present and connected so the wood frogs can successfully move between these habitats to meet their life history needs. Also, the amount of surrounding habitat and forest is important for vernal pool amphibians to be able to survive in an area. Um, turn, we've looked at, turns out vernal pool amphibians can travel quite a distance from vernal pools, up to um, 300 meters um, or almost 1,000 feet for some species in some cases. So they need a certain amount of forest around vernal pools for these species of populations to continue persist in an area or to utilize the vernal pool for breeding. So if you don't have enough forest in the area, you're not going to get vernal, you're not going to get these species or some of these species in the vernal pool. Um, so that's really important to maintain enough forest. And then also um, the amount of uh, the amount diversity and the connectivity of different wetland habitats, either other vernal pools or other types of wetlands in the surrounding area around the vernal pool is also important. 
And so um, there's been some studies where they found that there was greater amphibian species richness and abundance and um, longer persistence of these species in um, areas where you have uh, the wetlands that are part of these larger wetland clusters, maybe like 14 or more other wetlands in the area, and also um, wetland clusters where you have different wetland types, you know, temporary wetlands, semi-permanent wetlands, and permanent wetlands. And so um, having that strategy, especially with, um, you know, climate change, where, where things are more, you know, have um, increasing unpredictability, having that um, diversity of wetlands, the clustering of wetlands, uh, you know, vernal pools with different um, hydro periods, and they're connected, um, maybe in a really important strategy for conserving these amphibian species. And so amphibians, um, vernal pools are, you know, like we mentioned a really important habitat for invertebrates and, and for amphibians, but also for other wildlife species. So they've documented over 550 animal species use vernal pools in the Northeast, um, including some rare species. So this morning, I understand you heard about Michaela talking about spotted turtles using um, uh, vernal pools, also like Blanding's turtles, and a number, uh, there's several other rare species that um, utilize vernal pools quite a bit. And um, vernal pools also provide a lot of really important parts of the nutrient cycle and e carbon export um, and food webs in these forest ecosystems. So think about all those amphibians, um, thousands of eggs that turn into larvae and then turn into adults. So they're providing food for um, a lot of other, and those invertebrates providing food for a host of other species um, in the vernal pool, but also as they move out into the surrounding landscape um, as adults, they're providing that energy, taking that out into the surrounding forest then as well. And then vernal pools as wetlands um, provide important services, ecosystem services like storing water, um, helping to recharge a groundwater table in some cases, and then also um, providing some flood control. But vernal pools face a number of threats. Um, you know, one for one, there's limited awareness. So a lot of people that don't know what vernal pools are, you know, and um, why they're important. There's also limited information about vernal pools. So we really haven't done a, a lot of work about um, tracking or identifying where they located in the state, you know, um, how, how many we have in the state, which ones might have greater productivity in terms of amphibian uh, breeding use or invertebrates. Um, and then there's limited protection for vernal pools. So there can be hard to identify. So sometimes, you know, when you're doing like uh, timber harvest, you might not even know a vernal pool is there. And so you might just go right over the vernal pool, especially if you're, you know, it, when the conditions are dry, like shown in the photo there, that's a vernal pool, but it'd be really hard to tell if you're not there, you know, during the wet season. Um, our current wetland regulations um, at the federal and the, um, at the state level focus on wetlands that are, um, at the state level, we focus on wetlands that are greater than five acres or uh, larger and um, wetlands that are either connected to or near the Great Lakes or um, an inland lake, river, or stream. And if, if they don't meet those criteria, they're not regulated at all. Um, so most of the protection for vernal pools in Michigan currently are voluntary in terms of um, like uh, forest certification standards um, or just kind of other voluntary guidelines. And vernal pools um, and their associated amphibian communities face a number of different threats, like many of our other wildlife species, um, you know, loss of uh, forested habitat or um, vernal pools have been developed, they've been drained or filled due to um, residential or commercial or agricultural development, um, roads are put in so it might fragment these habitats and also, um, again, we talked about posing a risk of mortality to amphibians. Um, some of these vernal pools have been converted to permanent ponds and then fish added to them. And uh, timber harvesting, you know, especially clear cutting, we've cleared a lot of the forest in some of these areas. And so that's removed the vernal pools as well as the amphibians that can occur there. Um, and then pollution, invasive species and climate change that can change you know, um, uh, patterns of precipitation and drying can affect uh, the, you know, how many vernal pools can occur in an area or how long they might hold water. And so things that we can do to try to um, help uh, conserve vernal pools and amphibians we can learn about vernal pools, uh, which you're doing here today. That's great. Um, you can share your knowledge. If you can just tell one person maybe about what you've learned today, that would be great. And you can help promote conservation of vernal pools. And there's a number of different ways to do that. Um, you can join the Michigan Vernal Pool Patrol, for example, which is a statewide um, citizen or community scientist program to help map and monitor vernal pools. We can get more data so we can better understand and, and uh, where they are and how we can better manage for them. And even if you're not you know, actually actively participating in the program, if you know, you know a vernal pool somewhere, you can actually just contribute that data as well. 
And then this website here um, is the website to the Vernal Pool Patrol hub site where you can get more information about the Vernal Pool Patrol. And um, if you're interested in um, joining the Vernal Pool Patrol, you can attend a training. Um, we've got a virtual training series coming up um, on Wednesday, March 19, 16, and 23rd from 6 to 8 p.m. There's three parts to that training. And then um, there'll be links on the hub site for that. We have a couple of in-person training workshops, one at the Pierce Cedar Creek Institute on Saturday, March 26th from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. So you can check their website for how to register. Um, and then we have one in the Flint area on uh, Saturday, April 9th. And then we've got some field outings like the MSU Science Festival, where we're just going to go out and take a trip to check out a vernal pool and some of the cool species that you might find there in the spring. Um, you can join the Vernal Pools Partnership. We've got a Facebook page um, and a website. So it's a public-private partnership to help promote awareness and protection of vernal pools. Well, there's a lot of different partners there. Um, and so we've, we're doing some really great work, and we can always use more help. And then if you actually have vernal pools on your property or you manage vernal pools, you, are there things that you can do to help manage and protect vernal pools? And so uh, maintaining their, you know, just protecting existing vernal pools, maintaining their hydrology, um, water quality and chemistry. We talked about how important these things are to amphibian use and breeding success. Um, maintaining, you know, increasing woody cover um, objects in the vernal pools, avoiding, reducing or closing roads potentially during those um, mass migration events. Uh, maintaining clusters of vernal pool and, you know, having a diversity of vernal pools with different hydro periods um, can also help. And then if you have a vernal pool, a really important critical factor is maintain that forest or buffer surrounding vernal pools. Then. And this is a strategy that's been proposed in the Northeast um, where, you know, you have a 100 foot buffer and then you maybe even have up to a 400 foot buffer around vernal pools and then certain um, activities that you would try to limit or manage um, during those in those different areas around vernal pools, again, to help manage habitat for these vernal pool amphibians. And I just want to say, lastly, are we making a difference? And I would say we, um, we are, yes. <laughs> We've seen increased awareness, increased collaboration, increased data collection about vernal pools, and then um, some you know, opportunities that we've seen where people have tried to help um, increase protection for vernal pools as well. So I hope that you'll consider helping us conserve vernal pools in some way. And thank you. And here's my contact information. If you have any questions, feel free to you know, follow up. Awesome. And I put into the chat um, the link if people want to register for those virtual trainings that are coming up. Uh, I put in a bit.ly link because the link was a little long, <laughs> but it's just a bit.ly 2022 virtual vernal pools. Uh, you can also go on the websites, but they are up. Uh, I like Casey just said registered. So yay, uh, more people learning about vernal pools. That's a great way to just keep talking about them, keep them at the far front. And I love how vernal pools bring together basically all the species that we've talked about today. Um, and so this is just, this is great. Thank you, you man. Um, this has been a lot of fun. I don't see any questions in the chat or in the Q and A, but I know you, you man's uh, email is up there. Uh, I know we're hitting the end of our time for the conference and it's getting a, it's been a long day, but we've had a lot of great learning today. So thank you, you man. This was a great talk, a great way of ending our conference today. Um, and I hope you want to learn more about vernal pools in the future, everyone that joined us today.